Uh, but let me say good morning to everyone. Happy Sunday and welcome. Uh, it is good to be here with you again. Uh, and today's lesson is entitled, The Way. Uh, and as you just heard, this is one of the I Am statements of Jesus. Jesus identifies himself as the way. Uh, this is a key term that we see used throughout Scripture. Uh, and I think in many ways this lesson is going to be similar uh, to one we had a few weeks ago, the presence of the Lord. Uh, I want us to examine together how this term is used in the Old Testament and the New. Uh, because not only did Jesus identify himself as the way, the early disciples spoke of following the way. Uh, in fact, we see the church described uh, as the way, or those who are of the way. Uh, you see, the, the early Christians understood that God had a plan for them. Uh, when we're describing the way, we're describing a path uh, as a, a place we are meant to be to get from where we are to where we need to be. And that was the work that Jesus continually involved himself in, bringing people from where they are, uh, which is a sin-sick soul, back into a good relationship with God. This path, this way, uh, is our only access to the Father. Uh, but what does the Bible have to say about this phrase, and how can we be sure that we walk in that way today? Uh, first, I want to look at the way in the Old Testament. Uh, and the first passage we'll look at is Deuteronomy 31.29. Uh, Deuteronomy 31.29, and we find this as part of Moses' last address to the people. Uh, this is near the end of his life, and Moses provides this uh, as a warning and an admonition to the Hebrew people. Deuteronomy 31.29, he says, For I know that after my death you will become utterly corrupt, and turn aside from the way which I have commanded you. And evil will befall you in the latter days, because you will do evil in the sight of the Lord, to provoke Him to anger through the work of your hands. Uh, and I don't have to tell you, because you already know, part of this history of Israel is that they would continually go after idols. They would continually go after foreign gods, forsaking the one true God. And you remember Moses saw this firsthand, especially coming down from Mount Sinai, and he finds Aaron there and the Hebrew people with a golden calf. And they say, this is the God that brought you up out of Egypt. And it's utterly false because it was the one true Jehovah God. Uh, but just as he says here, uh, when they do these things, they are leaving the way. Uh, and don't miss the way Moses describes it. He says, to turn aside from the way which I have commanded you. Moses was God's mouthpiece. He was the speaker for the Hebrew people. He was that go-between. And you remember the people put him in this position. Uh, they said, we don't want to talk to God. We're too fearful to go for before Jehovah. But you, Moses, go hear what he has to say and come tell us. And so when Moses says, you've turned aside from what I have commanded you, it's the same as saying you've turned aside from the commandment of God. You have turned from the way that God has lined out for you. Uh, and it didn't get much different throughout the Old Testament. If you go to Judges 2 and verse 17, we'll see much the same. Judges 2.17, it says, Yet they would not listen to their judges, but they played the harlot with other gods and bowed down to them. They turned quickly from the way in which their fathers walked in obeying the commandments of the Lord. Uh, now you know this time period, this is after Moses and even after Joshua. Uh, they weren't perfect, but for the most part, under Joshua's leadership, the Israelites were pretty good. Uh, but after his death, uh, and after his contemporaries, what you find is a return uh, to much wickedness and another desire to heap to themselves foreign gods, and that's what they're doing, uh, to go uh, as a harlot, to go and to be unfaithful to Jehovah God. And notice here it's described in the same way, to turn from the way. And here it says to turn quickly. Uh, to turn quickly from the way in which their fathers walked, which was the way of obedience, uh, the way that would highlight Jehovah, the way that would submit to His will. Uh, and so this is not a point unique to the New Testament. And I think we need to realize that, especially as it's attached to an I am statement of Jesus. When Jesus says, I am the way, this brings to bear every Old Testament verse about this way. The way in which the fathers walked, the way in which Moses commanded, the way that Jehovah gave instructions to His people. Uh, when we leave that, we leave God. And in the same way, obedience is tied to Christ. Uh, but a little further in the Old Testament, in Psalm 32 and verse 8, uh, we have the way mentioned again. Psalm 32, 8 says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. And we pair with this Psalm 119, 30. Uh, in 119.30 it says, I have chosen the way of truth. Your judgments 
I have laid before me. Uh, and this goes to show and back up the idea we were trying to lay down. Uh, when it says the commandments that Moses has given, or when it says the way in which your fathers have walked, it's clear that we're talking about those who are obedient to God, uh, the way of truth. And you can see this from both of these passages, uh, that God will instruct His people and teach them in the way that they should go. And He did this through Moses and the prophets and others. Uh, and in the same way, the way of truth, Psalm 119, uh, that is the way as lined out in the judgments and teachings from Jehovah God. Uh, and so as we see this line up throughout the Old Testament, there is a path. Uh, there is the way. And when you're walking in that way, you're walking in obedience, you're walking in right relationship with God, uh, you are serving Him and submitting to His will. You recognize God as sovereign ruler and creator. Uh, when you leave that way, when you turn aside from it, you are being unfaithful. Uh, you have gotten off the, the marked path. You have gotten off the instructions of God. And you go into the world, you go into sin, and you go into danger. Uh, that's the way as it's laid out even in the Old Testament Scriptures. Uh, but what we need to talk about as it relates to this issue is the way of man. Uh, and this is the second point that we come to. Because just as sure as there is a way lined out by God, there is a way from man. There is a way that humanity in our own wisdom has lined out and we say, well, here's a different path. Uh, see what Scripture has to say about that. Uh, we go to the book of Proverbs for much of this point. Uh, and first is Proverbs chapter 4, verse 14 and 15. Proverbs 4, 14 and 15. It says, Do not enter the path of the wicked, and do not walk in the way of evil. Avoid it, do not travel on it, turn away from it, and pass on. Uh, we pair with it Proverbs 12, 15. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he who heeds counsel is wise. Uh, now the first thing I want you to notice here, the way of man uh, is the way of a fool. Uh, because when man tries to act without God, Man fails every single time. Uh, we need God. We are dependent on our Creator. Mankind needs a Savior. Uh, and so in every sense, trying to stand alone uh, is a recipe for disaster. Uh, but notice this strong admonition from Scripture. When it describes the way of the wicked, uh, when it describes the path of evil, uh, Proverbs in 4.15 uh, tells us this, Avoid it, do not travel on it, turn away from it, and pass on. Now, the way I was raised, and it may have been similar in your house growing up, if my father said something once, I was required to obey it. If my father said something once, I need to listen up because that was instruction and I had to obey. But look here, we've got it four times. Avoid it. Do not travel on it. You need to turn away from it. You need to pass on. You get the idea this message is important. The way of man leads to destruction, and that's why we see such a strong commandment against it. Four times, you need to get away from this. This is not where you need to be. Uh, and as we see the way of the Lord and the proper way to go, the way of man holds every danger, holds every misfortune. And so that's why he says over and over, don't go in this way. Uh, he describes it as the way of the fool, like we mentioned. Uh, what we need to do uh, is to heed counsel, take the advice from God and His servants to get back in the right way. Don't follow in the way of man. Uh, the book of Proverbs has more to say on this point from chapter 13 and verse 15. Uh, it says, Good understanding gains favor, but the way of the unfaithful is hard. Uh, the way of the unfaithful, that's the way of man. Uh, that's the way of wickedness. And it's described here as hard, hard. Why? Uh, because you're doing it without God. Uh, and clear from this context also is you're doing it without understanding. Uh, you're doing it without the knowledge that comes from the instruction of God. Uh, and we pair with that Proverbs 14:12. Uh, there is a way that seems right to man, but its end is the way of death. Uh, you know, I wanted to include this verse, but you know, I could have chosen it from two different contexts. Uh, because just two chapters later in Proverbs 16, this is repeated almost word for word. There's a way that seems right to man, but its end is the way of death. We have to understand this. Acting without God, going out on our own path, blazing our own trail, fails every single time. Uh, the way of man is a recipe uh, for a life that is stained by sin and leads to death. Uh, you won't get any other result. Uh, from the New Testament, I want to show you Jude, the, the first and only chapter, and verse 11, uh, describes the way of man in a very particular way. Uh, Jude, verse 11, it says, Woe to them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, uh, 
They have run greedily in the air of Balaam for profit and perished in the rebellion of Korah. Uh, Now let me make this point because I believe it's important. You know that Jude writes his letter uh, wanting to talk about the common salvation, but he sees it's more needful uh, to tell Christians to contend for the faith. You need to defend this message of truth. And so he spends a great deal talking about false teachers. When he describes these false teachers, he shows very clearly that they're all one and the same. Now there are different kinds of false teachers and there are different kinds of false doctrines. But as Jude writes, inspired by the Holy Spirit, he says this is exactly the same as the way of Cain. Cain who slew his brother Abel. This is exactly the same as Balaam. Uh, Balaam who was swayed by money to curse the people of God. This is exactly the same as Korah and his rebellion against the leadership of Moses and Aaron. And so it doesn't matter what way of man you choose. See, society has it in their mind. Each one can take their own way and you can chart out on your own you're being an individual and how good for you. Uh, No, he says any way of man, it's all the same and it's all wrong. Any way of man is all rebellion and it's all steeped in failure. Uh, There is the idea of perishing. There is the idea of greed. There is the idea of going astray. And he says, woe to them. Uh, Woe to anyone who goes in the way of man who neglects uh, the path that is laid out by God. Uh, But just as as assuredly as Scripture speaks against the way of man, we see the way of the Lord uh, lifted up. Uh, As we look to the way of the Lord and and how it's laid out in Scripture, uh, I want to show you first from Psalm 119, uh, verse 33. Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I shall keep it to the end. Uh, To be instructed by God. Uh, That is the way of the Lord. And we cannot allow any other source uh, to be our our origin for this teaching. Uh, The way of the Lord must come from God. It is, after all, belonging to Him. It is of the Lord. Uh, The way of the Lord doesn't come from the traditions of men. It doesn't come from the feelings of my heart. It doesn't come from popular opinion or a vote that we might call. It comes from the teaching of God. Uh, That is always the case. The way of the Lord as taught uh, by the statutes, the teachings, the judgments, the principles uh, of Jehovah. Uh, In Proverbs 10 and verse 29, it says, The way of the Lord is strength for the upright, but destruction will come to the workers of iniquity. Look at these two pictures, because the Bible lays them right beside each other. We have destruction and we have strength. Uh, Imagine, if you will, a house. And this house is beset by some calamity. Uh, We've got a violent storm that comes through. And in one picture, we have strength. The house stands firm. The storm does nothing to shake the foundations. The house is without damage. But in the other picture, we have destruction. Uh, The storm comes through. The house is utterly destroyed. It's gone. What's the difference? According to this verse, the way of the Lord will provide our spirit's strength. The way of the Lord will provide us that foundation that we need and so that nothing can shake us. We will never be destroyed. But the way of man, the way of foolishness, Uh, That is destruction, and that's what he calls there workers of iniquity or lawlessness. Uh, Further, in the book of Proverbs, chapter 12 and verse 28, uh, it says, In the way of righteousness is life, and in its pathway there is no death. Uh, So the same idea, but with a different picture. Uh, Instead of strength versus destruction, now it's life versus death. And you can choose. If you stay in the way of the Lord, you have life. If you neglect that, if you go after the way of man, there's death and the eternal destruction that is tied to sin every single time. Uh, Proverbs 16.31 puts it this way, The silver-haired head is a crown of glory if it is found in the way of righteousness. I think it's a very interesting point. When we think about sin, and when we see sin highlighted in Scripture, usually it is tied to the recklessness of youth. Uh, usually it is tied to the foolishness uh, of sowing wild oats and the inexperience that says, uh, can't I just live it up? Uh, When those have lived and gained experience, uh, have seen the consequences of both sides, those choices of life and death, those choices of strength and destruction, what we normally find uh, is experience shows them uh, that the way of God is the right way to go. Uh, Now that doesn't mean everyone who's older lives righteously, uh, but that's the design. Uh, that those who have those silver hairs, uh, they have the wisdom uh, from their time because they've seen the good and the bad. Uh, They've seen the rewards of following God, and they've seen the pain that comes uh, when you neglect Him. Uh, We come into the New Testament, Matthew 7, 
Uh, this is a popular t- context to bring up with this idea of the way. Uh, Matthew seven thirteen and 14. It says, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. Uh, as we think about the way and the way of the Lord versus the way of man, uh, I want you to see very clearly what's said here. Uh, and what I've provided for us and what I'm reading from is the New King James Version. Uh, if you've heard this in King James, you'll see the word straight. Uh, and we often make the mistake of describing the good way as being straight and narrow, as in straight like an arrow. Uh, but that's not the idea. Uh, straight is S-T-R-A-I-T. Uh, and the word difficult is what's supplied here in the New King James. Uh, this is the accurate idea for this picture. Uh, the way of the Lord is in many ways harder than the way of man. Uh, and we need to realize that because oftentimes temptation uh, is pulling us to the easy way. Uh, it says just do what comes natural. Uh, and sin comes natural for us because what we see uh, is a chaotic world where sin has its reign. Uh, but what we are called to do is to come out of that, to come out of the world and follow the example of Jesus, the higher Christian ethic, to go in the way of the Lord, which is more difficult. But look at the end, the way which leads to life. And few there be that find it. Why is it that few find that path that leads to life? because few are willing to walk in the way of the Lord. Uh, There are many who would rather take the downhill track that leads straight to Satan's home. Uh, Take the difficult track that calls us to righteousness. Take the track that calls us to honor, to a life submissive to our Creator. Uh, That's the way to life. The other path leads to nothing uh, but destruction. Uh, And now our key text, John chapter 14. The section I'm going to read is verse 4 to verse 7. Uh, John 14, 4 to 7, he says, And where I go, you know, and the way you know. Uh, Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, and how can we know the way? Uh, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also, and from now on you know him and have seen him. So this key verse, the I am statement of Jesus, he says, I am the way. And I don't think it's by accident that this is connected to what's said at the start of John 14. And you heard it in our scripture reading, the idea of many mansions, those heavenly homes prepared for the faithful. Uh, the idea of the way being the identity of Jesus. The idea of this path and knowing the Father by knowing Him naturally points to that heavenly home. Uh, you see, this way, this path, though it's sometimes difficult, it has the greatest ending that could ever be. The greatest destination, that home in heaven with God. Uh, And as Jesus lays it out, especially at at the end uh, of verse 6, no one comes to the Father except through me. Uh, This picture shows us how exclusive the Bible makes this issue. Jesus is the way and there is no other. If it were not for Him, no one comes to the Father. If it were not for Jesus, no one goes to heaven. If it were not for Jesus, there is no salvation. But since He is the way, there is a way in which we can walk. Since He is the way, there is the path of the Lord. And since He is the way, there is salvation. There is a heavenly home. There is every good blessing that is possible in the church. And that's exactly what He's highlighting. When He says, I am the way, He's saying you can know the Father. He's saying you can have salvation. He's saying you can be in that heavenly home. This is the greatest message of Christianity. Uh, And people so often neglect it. Uh, But one thing we need to mention as well uh, this this will be our last point for this morning. Uh, but it is the way and the church. Uh, and as we study this phrase in the Bible, this, I think, is the most interesting point. The first century church was known by many names. Uh, and we read about how they were first called Christians in Antioch. Uh, we like to mention Romans 16, the churches of Christ. Uh, there's also attachments to the church of God. Uh, I like in Revelation, the, the letters to the seven churches of Asia. They're just called the church at whatever city. Uh, But did you know one of the most used names for the church in the first century was the way? Uh, And we see this brought up over and over again in the book of Acts. The church called the way. And how fitting because Jesus said, I am the way. The church, uh, Christians, are followers of Christ and so they're called the way. uh, That they're walking in His steps. Uh, First I'll show you in Acts chapter 9 and verse 2. Uh, Now this is before 
uh, Paul's conversion, and so he's Saul of Tarsus at this point. And in Acts 9, verse 2, uh, he asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Uh, and it's clear from the context who he's talking about. He's talking about Christians. Uh, he's talking about the church. Uh, that which started in Acts 2 with the sermon from Peter and the Holy Spirit falling on the apostles, uh, he calls them those who were of the way. Uh, Saul here seeking to persecute the church, but you know uh, this is the same group that he would later join and that he would represent uh, to be a great spokesman for Christianity for the way. Uh, And you'll find over and over it's still referred to by this term. Uh, And I think it's a link to Jesus in his statement. Uh, Later in the book of Acts, he's representing the church in Ephesus. Uh, Paul is speaking things concerning the kingdom of God. Uh, Look in chapter 19 and verse 9. Acts chapter 19 and verse 9, he was speaking in the synagogue there, uh, but this verse tells us, But when some were hardened and did not believe, but spoke evil of the way before the multitude, he departed from them and withdrew the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. Uh, And so we see here he is representing the things concerning the kingdom of God, uh, whereas this verse tells us the way. Uh, Those in the synagogue no longer like to hear it. They're getting angry at him. And so he continues this work elsewhere. Uh, He departed, withdrew the disciples, and he's here in the school of Tyrannus, a prominent figure who had a school, either who founded it or who's hosting it, uh, but he's able to meet here with interested parties and speak to them about Christ, uh, to speak to them about the Messiah, the Son of God, who said, I am the way, and to promote how they can get on this path, the way of the Lord, and to attain salvation, to live righteously for Him. Uh, an honorable life in the service to God. And again, it's, it's ascribed to this label, the way. Uh, further in chapter 19 and verse 20, uh, it says, So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. And verse 23 tells us, About that time there arose a great commotion about the way. Uh, you see, again, the church is referred to in this term. Uh, and you have to realize many people at this time are viewing Christianity as merely an offshoot of Judaism. Uh, They're looking at this as some sect of a few Jews who have gone off on this idea uh, and they call them the way, kind of like you would talk about the Essenes or you talk about the Sadducees, some sect of Judaism. But what they're beginning to see as it comes out more and more and as more people are obedient to the gospel, that this is not some offshoot of Judaism. This is not some sectarian branch. What you're seeing uh, is the Christian movement. You are seeing the way following after the one who is the way. The Messiah. Uh, We also see this mentioned when Paul makes a defense of himself uh, before Governor Felix. uh, In Acts 24 and verse 14, Uh, he's making a defense of himself and of the way, uh, showing that they're not a riotous group. They're not trying to uh, overthrow the government. They're not trying to overthrow Judaism for that matter. Uh, But in 24.14 he says, But this I confess to you, that according to the way, which they call a sect, So I worship the God of my fathers, believing all the things which are written in the law and in the prophets. Uh, This is similar, by the way, to what we saw Stephen deal with just before he's martyred. He's accused of blasphemy against Moses and the law. And Paul here shows very clearly, we believe in the law. We believe in all things about the law and the prophets. And what you see is uh, the fulfillment of that in Christ Jesus. And so he describes to them the way, and Governor Felix is able to better understand Christianity by this explanation that's given, but still with that term, the way. Uh, Further in chapter 24 and verse 22, uh, it says, But when Felix heard these things, having more accurate knowledge of the way, he adjourned the proceedings and said, When Lysias, the commander, comes down, I will make a decision on your case. Uh, Now I want you to see, because by this point we've had enough text to realize Uh, When he says, I have a more accurate knowledge of the way, uh, he's saying, I have a more accurate knowledge of the things concerning the kingdom of God. Uh, I have a more accurate knowledge of Christianity. I have a more accurate knowledge of the way of the Lord through Jesus. And so we're seeing this term, the way, standing as a whole for the entire doctrine of Christ. And again, how fitting, because Christ says, I am the way. I would hope that we could appreciate the significance of this phrase. Uh, But as we move to our conclusion, let me show you one last verse. Uh, 2 Peter 2 and verse 21 uh, really shows how important an idea this is. 2 Peter 2.21, For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it 
to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. There is a very clear and a very powerful saying from this verse. There are those who have never obeyed the gospel. Uh, There are non-believers, non-Christians who have never come to Christ. But then there are those who have come to Christ, have obeyed the gospel, become Christians, but then go back into the world. They've fallen away. They've left the work of God. They've left God. And the saying here is that it would be better to be a non-believer who had never known Christ than to be one who was on that way who was on that path, who was in Jesus, but then left. Uh, Because you have turned down, you have turned away from the righteousness of God. Uh, You have left this work and you have left the safety, the power, uh, because you remember strength versus destruction, life versus death. You've given that up, all that you had in Christ. Uh, And so it says here it would be better uh, if you had never known that. Uh, What's it called here? To turn from the Holy Commandment. The Holy Commandment tells us to get on that path, uh, to get in the way, uh, the glory land way, as the song we sang, uh, to be in the way of God. Uh, Remember the words of Jesus that we started with, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, He clearly identified himself uh, as the path to God. And you remember, it's an idea we see throughout Scripture. Uh, We saw the way as presented in the Old Testament. Uh, We saw the way of man compared and contrasted with the way of the Lord. Uh, And we saw the way and the church, uh, even using that as a title to describe God's people, to describe Christians. And so I want you to think about your own life this morning. Are you walking in the Lord's way? Uh, Could someone look to you and your life and say they are a man of the way or they are a woman of the way? They are living as Jesus taught. Uh, You know, it's very important because as we look at the first century, the apostles uh, and those early disciples and preachers, they were recognized as having been with Jesus, as having worked with Jesus, as bringing the doctrine of Jesus. And if we're not recognized in that way in the world today, there's a serious problem. Are you walking in the way of the Lord? And have you come to Jesus who is the way? If you're not a Christian this morning, that opportunity is available to you. It is the invitation of the Lord uh, to come and walk in His path, uh, to go in that one and only way, the way of Jesus Christ, into a right relationship with the Father, uh, to put Him on in baptism, to be washed in His blood. And if you're a Christian who's turned aside, uh, one who has left the way, you know the importance of this. You've seen it from Scripture. You must come back to God. And we'll do anything that we can to help you in this walk. Uh, If we can assist you in any way this morning, we would invite you to come as together we stand and sing.